for worship and to sit under the preaching of the word. We're going to begin our service this evening from, with a reading from Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 8 through 17. We see here God's covenant made with Noah. It's a great reminder to us that our God is faithful to his promises. And so as we read here the promises of God to never again destroy the earth by a flood, we recognize that this is the same God who declares to us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God stand and are sure and steadfast because of the character of our God. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the livestock and every beast of the field with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Let's pray together as we gather for worship. Oh, Father, we thank you that as we gather, we gather on the basis of your word. God, your word constitutes us as a people. We thank you, God, that you are eternally faithful to the words that you have declared to us. We thank you that you are faithful, God, to the word of salvation that has come to us in Christ. And therefore, God, we can come to you and lift up our praises to you. And God, we thank you for the great privilege that that is. And so, Father, I pray that as we sing this evening, as we are instructed in your word as we see from Scripture the great salvation that is ours in Christ, God, may our hearts rejoice. May our lives be shaped and transformed. And may you be glorified. May our eyes be lifted up and may our desires be bent toward the glory and the honest honor and the majesty of Christ as our highest good. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as we sing to the Lord this evening. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call. Father, you worked your way. Righteousness of my own, I had no right to draw near the throne. Father, you love me still, and in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child. you rose that I might be a new creation. 
Our Acts reading comes out of chapter 8, verses 14 through 25. Acts chapter 8, 14 through 25. There's a few different things we see in this section, but the one thing we should take and understand is that the Holy Spirit cannot be purchased. <coughs> there's nothing we can pay, there's nothing we can do to earn the coming of the Holy Spirit, but we see that it is the work of God that the Holy Spirit indwells and makes people new. The other thing I want you to notice here is the power of prayer. The power of prayer from another believer, from someone else, that it changes and ratifies and makes things new here on this earth. So, reading out of Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings towards us. We thank you that you have saved us. You have redeemed us. Through the work of Christ, our sins have been washed away. There was nothing we could have done to... Uh, obtain this forgiveness. There's, there's not enough works we could do. There's not enough tithes and money we could offer you. Not enough sacrifices we could pour out. We thank you that it is through Christ and Him alone that He is sufficient for our salvation. He is sufficient to redeem us and make us new. Lord, I pray for this church and as we, as we think about this upcoming week and how we, we go back to what appears as our, our normal lives, that this, this one day we set aside that is uh, spent worshiping you with one another, that's spent singing songs with you. May this not be necessarily just unique to this one day, but may it overflow into the rest of our lives. May it overflow into our workplaces. May it overflow into our homes. Lord, I ask that you strengthen us, that we seek to glorify you, that we seek to worship you in all places, that we don't divide this church from the rest of the world, that we don't divide our Christianity from the, the world that we live in the rest of the time outside of these walls, but that our Christian identity overflows into the streets, overflows into our homes. Lord, I pray that you give us a desire to be holy before you. Give us a desire to seek your will in our lives. We want to know you more. May we want to walk in your ways more. Lord, we confess that we are sinners, that we have broken Your law, that we've set ourselves at the focal point in many times. Our pride gets in the way. Our lust has taken over our hearts at times. Lord, we confess our sins before You. We confess these knowing that we have broken them before You. We've sinned against You. But we confess knowing that You forgive. Knowing that You amend our brokenness. That You make us new. Lord, we thank You for this forgiveness that is found in, in You alone. We thank You that such a great God, the Creator of all, the just judge, while looking at us in our sinful state, forgives us and finds us righteous because of Christ. Lord, I pray for the lost. May they know this truth. May we take the Gospel into the world. May the darkness be beaten back moment by moment as the Gospel goes forth, as the light of the truth goes out into the world. May they know that Christ has lived, died, and resurrected. That He sits in heaven now, having dominion over heaven and earth. May they know that their sins are forgiven in Him alone. May we proclaim this. Use us as Your instruments to proclaim this. 
Use us to evangelize the world around us, Lord. Give us the strength to see the hurting and the needy. Give us the strength and the wisdom and the words to preach the truth to the world. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to sing together. of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. Good evening. Good evening. It's great to be with you, church. Before I preach, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your ongoing love one to another. Thank you for your ongoing love for the world around us, for the lost, for our friends and family, co-workers, neighbors. Church, thank you for your ongoing service in the church, for the work of the church and the work of ministry. Thank you for your ongoing generosity and contributions for the kingdom. Most of all, thank you for your faithfulness to God above. Thank you for your steadfastness by the Holy Spirit, your dedication to the Word. I'm very thankful to what God has established here as a local church and very thankful to be in the, um, the gracious, merciful role of serving as your pastor. Thank you for your love, support, prayers. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, talking about redemption and the Trinity. I'm not trying to get further away from you all, but I'm right on the squeaky part of the floor. As if there were only one, right? <laughs> that one part. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. This passage of Scripture is so beautiful, so wonderful and glorious. To preach a sermon on it would almost be like trying to describe a 
precious diamond by simply putting it into words. That will never suffice. You have to see the diamond. And this is such a glorious passage, rich with the treasures of God's love and the riches of God's grace. The only way that I will truly see this passage and what it has to offer, and the only way you will truly see this passage and what it has to offer, is if the Holy Spirit opens our hearts, and if the Holy Spirit opens our minds to see the beauty of God's redemption that's put forth here. Of course, that's true in any sermon, isn't it? Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, redemption and the Trinity. The main point is that God's gracious redemption reveals God's triune nature. I'll say that again. This is a short sentence, but church, this is a major point of biblical theology and therefore of the Christian faith. God's gracious redemption reveals God's triune nature. I want to immediately go to verse 2, or uh, no, not verse 2, verse 9. And immediately go to verse 9, and then I'll have some more introductory words before we read the passage as a whole. But look at verse 9 with me. Making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose. You see, what's being talked about is something that's made known. Something that's made known. Making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose. Now the whole passage is about God's redemptive work in Christ. And at the, the center of this passage is the point that God's redemptive work in Christ reveals, or in the language of the passage, makes known to us God's eternal purpose. And also, as we go through the passage, also God's redemptive work makes known to us the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm getting at with that main point, that God's gracious redemption is the thing that reveals God's triune nature. Let's pray before we go any further. Father, I pray that you would help us to be tuned into this passage, to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Show us the wonder of what you've done for us in Jesus. And through that, show us the wonder of who you are. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Almighty God, Creator, King, Redeemer, our Father, our Brother, and our Holy Spirit who lives within us. Thank you, God, for this great work, this great love that you poured out into our hearts. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. The story of the Bible is the story of God making himself known, and also the story of God making a way for sinners to know Him. Did you get those two aspects? It's one story with two aspects. God is making Himself known, and God is making a way for sinners to know Him. All at once, the story of the Bible is a story of self-revelation, and it's also a story of gracious redemption. Really, any relationship is a story of getting to know someone, and a story of learning to love someone and put them before yourself. Think of a marriage relationship. A marriage relationship is about learning more about each other, getting to know each other more and more, and also a marriage relationship is about learning to serve each other, learning to love each other. It's a story of relationship, of knowledge of one another and loving and serving one another. The parenting relationship will be the same way. A relationship of friends will be the same way, getting to know one another, learning to love one another. And that's similar, those are similar to the story of the Bible. God making himself known to us and God loving us and graciously serving us and saving us. What's the point? What's the practical application? Well, it's one of those applications that first has to happen in the mind. 
The application is, as soon as we contemplate the salvation that we have, we're driven to a glorious sight of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also, the only proper way to think about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is to always have in mind the panorama of this great salvation that He has accomplished in Christ. You see, God's gracious redemption reveals His triune nature. And when we meditate on God's triune nature, we're driven back to gaze upon this great redemption. This is what all the Bible is about. And this is why we were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Because the baptism is an outward sign of the redemption that happened within us. And the redemption that happened within us happened because of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the redemption that happened within us made us into servants of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we're baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's also why Peter preaches in Acts 2, 32 and 33. This Jesus, God raised up. There's the Son and the Father right there. This Jesus, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God... And having received from the Father the promise of the, and he guesses, Holy Spirit. This Jesus, God raised up and gave him the Holy Spirit. So that the Son would then give us the Holy Spirit, reconciling us to God. The only way we're saved is because of the work of the Father and the work of the Son and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now that's what this passage maps out. What does this passage in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 do? It maps out the work of redemption by mapping out the roles of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what this passage does for us. It traces out, or it, you could say it outlines God's work of redemption. And the way that it does that is by explaining, here's what the Father did, here's what the Son did, here's what the Holy Spirit did. The work of redemption reveals God's triune nature. Let's read the whole passage, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will and to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The first section is what the Father did to save you. And it also tells us why He did it. What's the ultimate end to the praise of His glory? And the second section tells us what the Son did to save us. And also tells us why to the praise of His glory. 
And the third section tells us what the Holy Spirit did to save us, and it also tells us why. To the praise of His glory. Glory is simply the shining forth of what's good about something. The shine, here, the shining forth of what's good about God. The shining forth of His grace in redemption. And the praise of God's glory is simply praising God for the grace that He's shown forth. We've seen the glory of God in the gospel. We've been changed by the glory of God in the gospel. And now we worship God. That's the praise of his glory. We praise him for the glory of his grace and salvation. It's clear what Paul is doing. I know there's a lot of details here. I know it's a a lot of semicolons, a lot of commas. It's difficult sentence structure. I understand that. But what Paul's doing is is very simple. He's mapping out our redemption by mapping out the roles of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. First of all, you can look at verse 3, where all three persons of the Trinity are in view. Blessed be the God and Father. There you go. There's the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There you go. There's the Son. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, now that's the Father again, the Father, who has blessed us in Christ. Now latch your heart onto that prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase, in Christ. One of the most, if not the most important prepositional phrases in all of Scripture. And therefore, in all of human language. In Christ. And then he says, bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's not talking directly about the Holy Spirit because it's a spiritual blessing in view. That's not the person of the Spirit. But you and I know the only way you can have a spiritual blessing is if it comes from the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's just fake religion or just emotion that's uh, connected somehow to the exercise of religion or doing good deeds. You can't have a spiritual blessing unless it comes from the Holy Spirit. But that's just verse 3. That whole first section from verses 3 to 6 is focused on what God the Father did in our salvation. Go down to the very end of verse 6. The very end of verse 6. This is the way the section on the Father ends. With which he, the Father, has blessed us in the Beloved. In the Beloved. That's referring to Christ. God's unique, God's beloved Son. In Christ, verse 3, but now here, in the Beloved. He has blessed us in the Beloved. We'll come back to this later in the message. But all the blessings of redemption are mediated to us through Christ. All blessings of redemption are experienced by us in Christ, in union with Christ. When we're sinners outside of Christ, we do not share in the blessings of salvation. When we're sinners who come to Christ in faith, we're recipients of every spiritual blessing in the Beloved. That's the Son. And then go down to verse 13, the very end of verse 13. We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, whenever it happened in your life that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, that is the same moment that you were united to Christ by faith. That is the same moment you became a partaker of every spiritual blessing from God the Father. You can't have the blessings of the Father apart from the blessings of the Son. And you can't have the blessings of the Son apart from the blessings of the Holy Spirit. There's one God, one salvation. To know one is to know the others. It's clear what Paul is doing. He's mapping out God's redemptive work by tracing out the roles of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Quickly, before we get into, um, I do have a three-point outline. Shocker. I know. Um, But one, one more little 
but significant point before we get in. Go for it. John says go for it. Um, This passage also tells us the spirit that we should have when we're contemplating these things. This passage also models for us the heart that we should have when we're contemplating these things. And it's the first two words of the passage. Blessed be. This whole thing's a doxology. This whole thing is a, a word of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a word of blessing. It's a word of praise. It's a word of worship. The only proper way to contemplate God's redemptive work and the only proper way to contemplate God's triune nature is from a heart of awe and reverence before God. To say, blessed be God for all that He's given us. Praise be to God for all that He's done for us. Praise be to God for this great hope He's given us. Can you imagine life on earth without a true and lasting hope in God? The spirit we should have is captured by the heart of verse 3. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. God's gracious redemption reveals God's triune nature. Now here are your three points, okay? Give them to you so you can get them and then we'll, uh, we'll open them up as best we can. Number one, the Father planned redemption before the world. That's verses 3 to 6. The Father planned redemption before the world. Do you ever think about that? If God the Father didn't plan redemption from before the world, there would be no world and there would be no redemption. And I would not know God and you would not know God and we'd have no existence. The Father planned redemption before the world. The only reason the world exists is because it's the stage wherein God works out His plan of redemption for His own praise and glory. Amen? That's why the world exists. That's why you exist. All the mysteries of existence. I know we don't know everything, but we do know why the world exists. God created the world so that in the world He would work out His plan of redemption to manifest His wisdom, to manifest His power, to manifest His grace and mercy and love and kindness and be worshipped forever and ever by a people who truly reflect His character of holiness and righteousness. Isn't it an amazing thing? It's a wonderful thing. The Father planned redemption before the world. That'll be verses 3 to 6. Number 2, the Son accomplished redemption in the world. The Son accomplished redemption in the world. That'll be verses 7 to 12. The Father sent the Son. The Son obeyed the Father. And He obeyed the Father to accomplish the task that the Father set before Him, which was the task of your redemption. To reconcile you. To reconcile me. To God the Father. Jesus came. And He accomplished the work of salvation on this planet and he received his due reward of resurrection life and in grace the exalted christ gives us that resurrection life that's our salvation when jesus shares with us the resurrection life that he attained in his obedience the son accomplished redemption in the world and just like we said about the if the father didn't plan it before the world it wouldn't happen. He said the same thing about the Son accomplishing it in the world. If the Son didn't come to the world and accomplish our salvation, we'd have no way of knowing God. We'd have no forgiveness of sins. We'd have no hope. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have a Bible. If the Son didn't come and accomplish our salvation, there'd be no salvation. Salvation is not just a side note. Salvation is not just a subcategory of what's going on in the world man it is the top story front page news every day in every newspaper should be again god has shown mercy as a great and mighty savior to sinners lost it's what the world's about number three the spirit applied redemption to our hearts in our lives the spirit applied redemption to our hearts, in our lives, 
And that'll be verses 13 to 14. And that's where it gets most personal. Because that's where God's great salvation and your life intersect. It's the interface between your personal existence and your life on earth. And God's gracious redemption comes to you by way of the Holy Spirit. And you could probably guess, just like we said about if the Father didn't plan it, it wouldn't happen. We say the same thing about the Son didn't accomplish it, it wouldn't happen. We say the same thing about the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit doesn't apply this great salvation of God to our hearts by the Word of God, by the Gospel of Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit doesn't apply salvation to our hearts, our hearts have no salvation. Where are our hearts going to go to get salvation if the Holy Spirit doesn't give it to us? Are we just going to go, are we going to turn our hearts inwardly? All that's there is the corruption of the flesh. There's no salvation looking inwardly. Brothers and sisters, there's only salvation looking up to heaven where Christ reigns as a living Savior. Thank God, brother, for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Well, I've got to be careful here. I'm about to chase a rabbit. It's not only thank God for the Holy Spirit so that we could be saved, but thank God for the Holy Spirit so that we could do anything in the Christian life. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have the Bible. Because the Holy Spirit enabled men to write the Bible. The Holy Spirit mediated God's Word through men to write the Bible and preserve that Word for us can repent of one sin. You couldn't repent of one sin one bit without the Holy Spirit. We would not want to repent of one sin one bit without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Not a lesser God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit saves us. Just as the Father saves us. And just as the Son saved us. They have different roles in that same salvation. We have to do the best we can on this outline, okay? Number one, the Father planned redemption before the world, verses 3 to 6. Let's read it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The way I want to structure this section is by looking at the main verbs. There's four of them. Number one, blessed us. You'll see that in verse three. The Father has blessed us. That's verse three. Number two, chose us. The Father chose us. God the Father is the subject. And the verb, number one, is the Father blessed us. Number two, the verb is the Father chose us. Number three, predestined us. Again, the subject is God, God the Father. The action verb is predestined us. And then again, blessed us. That's the fourth main verb, blessed us. So you see at the very top and at the very bottom of this, you have that the Father blessed us and the Father blessed us. That's what frames out the Father's work in redemption. The Father blessed us and the Father blessed us. And then you move in. You move in a little bit. One notch down from the top and one notch up from the bottom. And you have a parallel verbs. He chose us and he predestined us. So he blessed us, he blessed us, specifically how? He chose us, he predestined us. Predestined is saying the same thing as chose us. Because if you see chose us, it not only says chose us, but it says when that choosing was done. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. So predestined just just takes that clause, chose us before the foundation of the world, and puts it into one word, predestined. So the top tier, he blessed us. The bottom tier, 
He blessed us. You move one notch down, one notch up, moving toward the middle. He chose us. He predestined us. And right in the middle is this, in love. Right in the middle of this hourglass. Right at the point of this arrow. Right in the middle of this X is God's love. All of this is an expression of God's love. All of this is the definition of God's love. Love to sinners. For before the foundation of the world, God set his love upon you, believer in Christ. Blessed us, chose us, predestined us, and blessed us. Just in case you, if you didn't get them, if you couldn't find them, blessed us is verse 3, chose us is verse 4, predestined us is verse 5, blessed us is verse 6, and right in the middle, right in the middle of it all, in love. In love. The very end of verse 4. Why? 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 Why did God do this? Love. Love. No need to speculate. No need to go down rabbit trails of speculative philosophy. Trying to ask these so-called deep questions. Love. God's love that he set upon sinners from before the foundation of the world. He chose us. He predestined us. Acts 13, 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. 2 Timothy 2, 10. Paul writes, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I'll read that one again. I want to make a comment about it. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. One of the things we see from that passage is, is that there's on earth... At any given time within the church age, there's on earth people who are elect but have not yet obtained salvation. Paul says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may obtain salvation. Because salvation must be obtained. Amen? Are you still with me? Salvation must be received by faith. All the elect will obtain salvation in accordance with God's perfect will. The doctrine of election spurs us to evangelism. The doctrine of election motivates us to world missions. That's what Paul said. That's what the Bible says. We endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may too obtain salvation. It says predestined, verse 5. Predestined. Uh, it's interesting. Verse 4 tells us what the Father did tells us when he did it, and tells us why he did it. Verse 4. What, when, and why. Even as he chose us, that's the what, in him before the foundation of the world, that's the when, and then the why. That we should be holy and blameless before him. That's the why. That's the blessings of salvation. Some of those spiritual blessings he mentioned earlier. Now you get to verse 5, and it sort of does the same thing. Verse 5 also sa it says the what he did, and the when he did it, and the why he did it. But then he'll have a bonus point for us. Verse 5, he predestined us. Well, that's the what he did. And the pre, the, the when he did it is in the word, pre. You preheat the oven. That means you heat it up first. You heat it up beforehand, preheat. Wait for the beep. Then you put in the frozen pizza. Then you put in the chicken nuggets. Preheat. Predestined. Predetermine. Pre Pre-choose. Predestined us is the what and the when. And then the why. For adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Are you happy to be a child of God? Are you happy that you're an adopted child of God? citizen of heaven that none can take away 
But then he also gives a bonus point on what basis. Not only the what, the when, and the why, but on what basis. On what basis? End of verse 5. According to the purpose of his will. According to the purpose of his will. And you can roll right into verse 6. The ultimate goal of this, to the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glorious grace. In other words, everything that you just read about the Father is, is this. The Father's glorious grace. And the way we're supposed to respond to that is to praise him for his glorious grace. Unto the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now that's the segue phrase. That's the transition phrase. Look at it again, the very end of verse 6. The very end of the section on the Father, it's going to lead into the section on the Son, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. With which, circle that, or in your mind's eye, circle that. With which he he has blessed us. What is it referring back to? It's referring back to the phrase that comes right before it, glorious grace. He's blessed us with this glorious grace in one way. One way and one way only can we be, we be recipients of this glorious grace that's in the beloved. This glorious grace of the Father with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Jesus is the way to experience God's grace. A relationship with Jesus is the way to experience God's love. A relationship with Jesus is the thing that reconciles us to God, makes us partakers of his glorious grace. A couple other references just for your own study. Romans 8, 29 to 30 is a good cross-reference on this. God's predestining work. And everyone who's predestined before time will be called in time. And they'll all be justified. And they'll all be glorified. Romans 8, 29 and 30. And 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 10. 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 10 is an incredible passage. It talks about the fact that God showed us grace before the foundation of the world. He showed us grace before the foundation of the world. Wrap your mind around that. You can't. I mean, if we could fully comprehend this, we'd have the mind of God. That's the only way you can fully comprehend these doctrines. There should be a mystery here. There should be an awe here. There should be a wonder here. Just like the incarnation. We know it's true and we know facts about the incarnation that this man, Jesus, was fully God and fully man. Our minds can't fully comprehend that. And it's the same on this doctrine. But, would it be good logic, would it be good spiritual logic to deny a doctrine just because we cannot fully comprehend it? God never said to do that. It should, it should drive us to a deeper worship. It should humble us more. A deeper contemplation of God and His infinite wisdom. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is the Father planned your salvation before the world, before time, before creation. The Father planned redemption before the world. Secondly, the Son accomplished redemption in the world. This is verses 7 through 12. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will. Otherwise, we'd never know His will, right? <laughs> right, man? making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that he who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Now, how do you put that into a, a simple outline for preaching? You can't do it. It's just too much. The best thing I could come up with is just go phrase by phrase and contemplate the glory of what's being said here. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses. Well, you know me. You set me free on that. I'll preach on that till 10 o'clock. Right there. That's it. That's all I need. In him we have redemption. Now, that's not... 
redemption from Egypt, which was an earthly redemption, a typological redemption. Brothers and sisters, we have redemption from the curse of sin and death. We have the greatest redemption, eschatological redemption, which means ultimate, which means final, which means supreme, irreversible. Redemption from the curse of sin and death. No longer under the dominion of sin in our hearts. Vince, praise the Lord. No longer in fear of death, living enslaved to the fear of death. Redemption. And then, oh, what a glorious phrase. Three words. If, you, if, you, if your heart has been changed by these words, if you grasp these three words, it'll melt your heart through his blood. A man had to die for me to know God. The God-man had to die for me to know God. The God-man, the appointed Son of God, had to come to earth, live a perfectly obedient life, give himself over to suffer and die, and in a miraculous event, dying on a cross, a supernatural event, a miraculous event, on the cross, Jesus, representing his people, taking our sin as his own. Can you imagine the love? Can you imagine the self-sacrificing benevolence of Jesus Christ? He shed his blood for us. He shed his blood. He left heaven, came to earth, suffered and died, shed his blood so we could go to heaven. He came to redeem us. He came to reconcile us to God. Redemption through his blood. And then the central summarizing blessing of redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Man, that's got to happen. God is not indifferent to sin. God is holy. God is righteous. He's the creator of the world. He reigns as king over the world. He is the lawgiver of the world. And all creatures made in God's image are accountable before God to live holy before him, to be obedient, to know him, to love him, to serve him, to worship him properly. Everyone's on the hook. Every human being of of an accountable age is on the hook, accountable before God. And we've all sinned. We've all broken his law. That's what trespasses is. Violating God's law, his moral law. To love God supremely, to love others as ourselves. Man, if, if our guilt is not washed away, we will stand before God one day guilty in every respect of every sin in heart, mind, word, and action. Praise God for forgiveness. That's not the only blessing of redemption, but that's the summary blessing, that Jesus forgives sinners. It's a good place to start in evangelism. What's the gospel message? That Jesus forgives our sin. People can understand forgiveness. They could because they know what it's like and they've messed up and there's someone in their life that won't forgive them. And they know how hard it is when Someone sins against them and they have to forgive another person. And people who've lived any amount of time on earth know that you can't have a real relationship without forgiveness. It'll it'll just crumble and burn. You need forgiveness. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses. Now I've got to speed up, don't I, Becky? I knew she would be the one to answer me. She's back there. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Uh, uh, All right. So that's 7a. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses. Summary. That's a summary of Christianity. Summary of the Bible right there. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his trespasses. And then the next part of uh, verse 7 is uh, the basis of that. The basis. Where did that come from? And it says this. According to the riches of his grace. God is rich in grace. God is rich in grace. And according to the riches of his grace, he sent Jesus to redeem us by dying for us and forgiving us. The basis of forgiveness is God's grace. You see the word grace um, in verse 6 and in verse 7, which is pretty cool, right? Because that's the transition verses from the Father's work to the Son's work. Right at the center, you have this sovereign grace, this grace of God. And then you go into verse 8. 
And ver- the beginning of verse 8 highlights that this act of grace is also an act of wisdom and insight. Do you see that in verse 8, the very beginning? This grace has been lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ also reveals God's wisdom, God's insight, which you can contrast to man's wisdom and man's insight. We would have never drawn it up like this. Then you go into verse 9. This act of grace, which is also an uh, an act of wisdom and also an act of insight, is also a revelation of God's eternal purpose making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. So in your mind's eye, take that trip back to before the foundation of the world. God had a purpose, and he set that that purpose forth in Christ. And now in the world, he's accomplishing that purpose in Christ. And when Christ returns, he'll culminate that purpose. Then you go into verse 10. This act of grace, which also is an act of wisdom and insight, and also a revelation of God's eternal purpose is, is, at the same time, the culminating era of history. The culminating age of history. Ten, as a plan for the fullness of time. That's the, that's the time we're in. The fullness of time. That's the last era of history as we know it. Not the last era of history. The last era of history as we know it, which is history in this fallen world still under the curse. Plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. That's a way of saying that Christ is making all things right. Christ is fulfilling every aspect of God's plan. Everything that God purposed, everything that God planned, everything that God aims to do and wants to do, everything that God is working to, Christ will achieve it all. Perfectly to the glory of his Father and the redemption of his people. It's the culminating age of history. Finally, verses 11 and 12 we'll take together. Verses 11 and 12 we'll take together. This act of grace which is also an act of wisdom and insight, also a revelation of God's purpose, also the culminating age of history, as well, at the same time, gives us not only blessings now, but hope for the future. And as you move move from the transition from the Son to the Spirit, the future inheritance becomes the central concern. The The future inheritance, the hope we have, verse 11 and 12. In Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. How many things, Jordan? How many things? All things. All things. Is anything outside God's control? All things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Again, it's to the praise of his glory. His glory revealed in this great redemption and we praise him for that glory As we experience it. Here you have inheritance. The beginning of 11. We've obtained an inheritance. And then you see this this great word. In verse 12. Hope. Hope in Christ. I hope you know. What your inheritance is. Resurrection body. Free from sin. In the presence of God. There's not. There's. No better situation that a human being could ever experience. This is it. A resurrection body, free from sin, in the presence of God. What a wonderful, wonderful inheritance. There's the Son who accomplished redemption in the world. Now quickly on the Spirit. The Spirit applied redemption to our hearts and our lives. This is verses 13 to 14. And I'll just tell you the verbs I want you to highlight as we go through. The verbs as they apply to us. Heard. Believed. Were sealed. And acquire. You heard something. You believed something. You were sealed with something. And you will acquire something. Heard, believed, were sealed, and acquire. In Him, in Christ, in Him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation. That's, well, that's when it happened. When, that's what Paul says, when, when, when you heard the gospel. And, what else? Heard, believed. Isn't this simple? Isn't a doctrine of biblical conversion simple? All these man-made complicated things and practices and steps we go through. You heard the gospel and you believed. When you heard the gospel and believed, were sealed. There's the sealed. Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you hear and believe, you're sealed with the Spirit. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The presence of the Spirit in our lives guarantees the future resurrection body free from the stain of sin in the presence of God, worshiping Him forever. Because, why? Because we heard the gospel and we believed the gospel. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So we will acquire this great inheritance that Christ earned on our behalf. Resurrection glory is ours in Christ. And I'm going to do this last thing very, very quickly, but I'll leave it as a homework assignment for you and your devotions to go back through this with something to underline or something to highlight that prepositional phrase, in Christ. Verse 3, blessed in Christ. Verse 5, through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, in the beloved. Verse 7, in Him. Verse 9, in Christ. Verse 10, in Him. Verse 11, in Him. Verse 12, in Christ. Verse 13, in Him. Verse 13 again, in Him. How do you receive God's blessings of salvation? In Him. And that's why we preach Him. We preach Him, we teach Him like there's no tomorrow. Because for some people there might not be a tomorrow. And we want them to be in Him. And the only way to be in Him is to hear the gospel and believe. Let's pray. Father, thank You for salvation. Thank You for Your plan. Lord Jesus, thank You for Your work. Holy Spirit, thank You for Your work in our hearts and minds. To give us this great gift of love and grace and wisdom and insight. The gift of redemption. Purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, we praise you. In his name we pray, amen.